This is Oshkosh Today, your connection to events and organizations in the Oshkosh area. Oshkosh Today is supported in part by the Friends of OCM, Aurora Healthcare, 855 Northwest Haven Drive, set design provided by House of Flowers, 1920 Algoma Boulevard. Welcome everyone to another great edition of Oshkosh Today. I'm your host Nick Austin. Oshkosh is Wisconsin's event city and for that event news we thank you for tuning into the program that highlights all of your city happenings. On today's program we'll talk about two events that will test your physical fitness while also allowing you to have fun, tell you where you can acquire the tools to help build healthy neighborhoods, dive into a great way to watch a movie, introduce you to our final student athlete of the month winner, all while remembering to focus on health. And up first, I'm joined by Katie Raymond and Gloria West, who are here to talk about the Oshkosh Half Marathon. So thank you both for being here. Thank you. Gloria, first off, just start us off and tell us, when is the Oshkosh Half Marathon this year? Well, it's going to be coming up soon. It is Sunday, April 21st, and uh, this is about our, our eighth year already. Uh, from, the, from the previous years, you said this is about the eighth year. What's been kind of the feedback in terms of people who have actually participated in this event? I mean, what kind of um, you know, positive feedback have you gotten from, from people who have either done it for the first time or have done it for multiple times? Well, there's a no number of reasons that people like this event. Uh, first of all, unlike a lot of half marathons or marathons in bigger cities, you might have a starting point and then a finish point. Mm -hmm. Two different places, you have to bus around. But uh, the way it's all laid out here is that everything will take place right down there by the Oshkosh Convention Center and Leech Amphitheater. So start line, finish line, uh, the expo, it all is in one area. And also it's a very flat course, but it's interesting because you go by the university, then you're on the Wyowash Trail, you're through some parks, you get a lot of diversity. When it, with a, an event that uh, I'm assuming now in its eighth year is as big as this, what are some of the challenges to, to getting that all together and, and really getting it all coordinated prior to that event date? Well, we, we put on a lot of events, and I would say that the Oshkosh rate's pretty high with having some really big challenges. Um, you know, this, it's this time of the year, and there have been times where we've had blizzard. We've also had to contend with uh, moving the whole start line and finish line one year because of the movie that wow. was shot downtown. And so, um, and then also by using the trails, sometimes there's a lot of water on the trails that we have to get out, but uh, it, it's been worth it because uh, people love it and it's really kind of the fitness icon for the community. I know that this is, uh, as we said, it's the Oshkosh Half Marathon, but there's also various events and, and distances with this, right? It's not just, what, 13 miles or whatever uh, right. what half of a marathon is. Yes, and it's not just for those people that run around in skinny tights and, 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 and eat bagels. <laughs> It's actually, you can walk the, mar the half marathon, but you can also do the 5K, which is about three miles, and you can walk or run that. And we have a really cute kids run the day before called the Lionhearted Kids Run that takes place right downtown too. What does this event mean to the community and, and maybe who, who benefits from this outside of just the fact that it's something that, you know, helps keep you fit when you're um, not, I guess, competing in this event, but just participating in it? Uh, well, we have um, three major charities, and we've also given to some other charities, but we have the Oshkosh Humane Society, we have the Christine Ann Center, and the Boys and Girls Club. And throughout the years now, we've raised well over 90000 It could be even 100000 um, We like to have all the nonprofit groups that we can benefit from the event, and we even uh, give some of our monies to the different high school programs, too. So it's a great community event. Yeah, that, that sounds great. Um, is, is it something... When is the, the registration deadline and, and how do you go about registering if you know, people watching or, or listening are, uh, are interested in, in participating? Well, the registration deadline, there's going to be a jump in price. So that uh, is coming up um, in, I think, in about a week. So you want to start looking at registering now. But you can register actually all the way up to the day. And you can do that by um, going on our website, which is MidwestSportsEvents.com and uh, grabbing a registration form from there. You can call our 800 number, which is 800-429-8044, and uh, we'll send you an application. Or you can register online, which is at active.com. 
Uh, now, Katie, you've been sitting there patiently, so let's uh, let's jump over to you now. I know that you are are involved with cerebral palsy and and um, actually uh, kind of hoping that people will join your team uh, in, in this Oshkosh Half Marathon event. Talk about um, you know your team, how you go about getting onto that, and and why your uh, um, or why cerebral palsy is a part of this event. Well. Um one of our programs we offer is our Keeping Fit exercise class. And we really want to get that name out in the community, so we thought it would be a great idea for us to walk in the Oshkosh um, 5K run and walk. So we are looking for clients, family, friends, anyone who would like to walk with us on April 21st. Outside of the Keep and Fit um, program that you just mentioned, what other types of programs are mentioned, or, or excuse me, um, supported or, or hosted through Cerebral Palsy and Arc? We have a wide variety of programs. We have um, a nutritional meal preparation class where clients learn to follow recipes to create low-cost, healthy meals. We have a children's class, which is an all-inclusive class for children 12 and under. Um, a movie day, which is just a fun afternoon, um, watching a movie with friends, having some refreshments. And sprinkled throughout the month are programs focusing on social development, recreation, and education as well. Going back to the, uh, the Keep and Fit uh, team, you're the, the coordinator of that. What types of exercises do you offer the, the Keep and Fit team, people who are, are part of that? We try all types of exercises. We've done yoga, Zumba, weightlifting, um, resistant bands, um, stress management, and all of our classes are altered to include both wheelchair and ambulatory participants. Wow. And where are these, these classes um, mostly taking place? Um, most of our classes take place um, in the lower level conference room of the Hooper Building located at 36 Broad Street here in Oshkosh. Now, does this team that you're, you're talking about, this uh, Keeping Fit team, outside of obviously you're, you're trying to get into the, uh, or, or participate in this Oshkosh Half Marathon, does the Keeping Fit team participate in any other local activities? Um, not yet. Um, we, do, we do have a walking club which meets at Menominee Park twice a month, so we're excited for the warm weather to get here so we can get out there again. Um, but we're going to try and be involved in some other 5K races coming up as well. How can people who are, are interested find out more information about the Life Basics program? They can give us a call at our office, 424-4071, and be put on our monthly mailing list. They can check out our website, cpmideastwis.com, and they can like us on Facebook, Cerebral Palsy of Mideast, Wisconsin. All right, well, thank you both for being here. Really appreciate the time. And it sounds like uh, one of those events that, like I said, it, it's a good reason to go out and... Uh, if not for just the social aspect, but also the keeping the keep and fit aspect of things. So uh, thank you both for, for sharing a little bit of your time. Thank You're you. Welcome. We hope that you'll join us. <laughs> Up next, she is our final student athlete of the month as she is back from a recent trip to Peru. Maggie Haverland of Oshkosh North joins us after the break. your passion? The arts? Education? Environment? Is it youth issues? Women's issues? Economic development? Or scholarships? For 75 years, the Oshkosh Area Community Foundation has been helping people like you make a lasting difference in the community. For ideas that can help you, your heirs, and your community, visit our website or call 426-3993. I am a teenager. I am online. I enjoy sharing thoughts. Music. Videos. Ideas. Information. I will not. I will not. I will not be a victim to threats. To stalking. To soliciting. To predators. I will be responsible. I will be careful. I will be honest. I will be smarter. I will get my parents involved. I will protect myself. I will be safe. I am a teenager. And I. And I. Will not. Be bullied. She's a 4.0 student who ranked first in her class of 301 at Oshkosh North High School, scored a 34 on her ACT, and graduated early 
from high school. She is former Oshkosh North High School student Maggie Havlin. Maggie, thanks for being here. Now, you recently, um, or, for, or first off, before we get into the trip to Peru, how did you go about graduating early from high school? I mean, th this sounds like something that, uh, you know, I think back on my high school days and I don't remember any kids graduating early from, from high school. It seems like everyone just kind of does the four year thing and then moves on. So talk about a accomplishing a feat like that. Um, I didn't take any study halls ever. So I got credits for every hour of the day that helped. And in middle school, I skipped two years of math and one year of English, so I got to take the high school classes early. And then, because I finished all the levels of the high school classes, I got to take the college classes, which are worth more credits. Okay. So I got 0.75 of a credit per semester instead of 0.5 of a credit per semester. Okay. So I finished with my credits for high school last year at the end of junior year. And then the first semester this year, I went to the university most of the time. I had two classes at the high school, a college English class and Spanish to get ready to go to Peru. So since you graduated early, do you already have your, your college set on where you're going to be going? Yes. I'm going to be going to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Okay. And I'll be attending the Jeffrey S. Rake School of Computer Science and Management there. That's a, that's a mouthful. Yes, it is. <laughs> what, uh, what attracted you to, to that uh, college and that, that program? Um, I'm going to be majoring in actuarial science to become an actuary. Okay. Basically predicting and quantifying risk with statistics because okay. I'm a math geek. Okay. And the Rake School will also give me a minor in computer science, so I will be able to understand exactly how all the computer programs that I'll be using function, mm -hmm. and that will give me a leg up on other actuarial science majors and getting a job. That sounds uh, a little bit too co complex to me. I, uh, for me, I'll, I'll stick to just hosting TV programs with people who are, are uh, you know, that smart. But uh, talking about this recent trip out to Peru, when were you there? I know it was we, we mentioned just recently, but when were you there? How long and, and kind of what was the purpose of the trip? Um, I didn't have to take any more classes, so I wanted to go do something different with my free time. And I decided that volunteering abroad was something that I wanted to try. So I got to Peru on January 5th okay. and I left Peru March 15th. And so the whole time I was there, I was working four hours a day at the orphanage, Monday wow. through Friday, and just basically playing with the girls because it, mm -hmm. it was their summer break, so they weren't interested in learning anything yeah. at that point. <laughs> uh, when you go on a trip like that, uh, and especially, I mean, you're not just going to, to do the sightseeing, you're obviously there and you said volunteering for an orphanage. How, how much did that make you appreciate life back home when you saw um, and, and kind of experienced some of that? It was really different there. It really made me appreciate all the support systems we have here in the States. Um, there was one little girl, she was about three years old and she had special needs, but she wasn't getting any help with anything like that. And if she was in the States, her life would have been completely different. Right. So it was just things like that that I noticed a lot. I realized that there are a lot of things that I take for granted here that sure. those little girls would never experience. How, how much, uh, while you were out there, how much did you get to practice your Spanish? And, and if you're uh, up to snuff on it, can you, can you say something in Spanish for us? <laughs> um, I was speaking Spanish basically Monday through Friday. And then on the weekends, all my friends spoke English. Mm -hmm. So when we hung out, we would speak English. Um, but what do you want me to say in Spanish? What, um, so, it's something that's PC, so when we translate it, it's okay for television broadcast. But, uh, you know, just say maybe uh, something more than, hi, my name is, is Maggie Haverland. Um, um, me amo Maggie Haverland y, y me gusta jugando tennis. <laughs> okay, now what did you say? My name's Maggie Haverland and I like to play tennis. All right, now get, that's a good transition for, for uh, bringing in your, your former coach here, Coach Van Bogard, am I saying that right? Vanden Bogard. Vanden Bogard, okay, yep. ex excuse me. Uh, so Coach, Maggie was an all-conference uh, tennis player for you. 
Talk about her commitment that you saw while she was uh, over there at North, not maybe only just on the court, but also off the court as well. Um, obviously, you already talked about uh, some of her accomplishments off the court, graduating early, um, taking college classes early, things like that. And that's a very easy transition for her right onto the tennis court. I don't have to do much coaching with her. She gets into a match and she's able to figure things out on her own so I can concentrate on other people, which is nice. Um, but if I do have to go out and talk to her, she's able to understand what I'm saying to her and it makes my job a lot easier. Um, off the court, I know when we started practice, girls tennis season starts before school starts in August. So she was actually working her summer job and she would come right from her summer job to practice in the morning which we had early in the morning but it wasn't early for her because I think work started at 4 30 in the morning for her so just a high school student working that early and then having the commitment to drive to practice mm -hmm. give all the work they can at practice is just a testament to what type of person she is on and off the court what separates her from from maybe other um you know athletes you've had come through your program obviously we just talked about the commitment that's a big thing but mm -hmm. but what other things kind of separate her and, and maybe make her a, a, a special um, athletic contributor to to any program regardless of whatever sport she would be in not only the commitment I think just the self-drive that she has for herself it's not always about you know her going out there and giving her best effort, but she gives more than her best effort. She, she's never gonna give up on the court. She's never gonna give up on the team. Um, she's gone through some injury that most people probably would have said, no, I probably shouldn't play this match, but she said, no, I'm gonna give it my best effort and go out there and do what I have to do for the team and for myself. So just that drive that she has for herself and for her teammates. Maggie, back to you. I know that um, outside of uh, school and athletics, that you were also involved uh, in, in a lot of different extracurricular activities. Talk about some of the things that you were involved in and, and kind of why you got involved in those. Um, I was involved in student council and the Polaris National Honor Society, both community organizations. I got to plan a lot of events in the school and um, that I decided to do just because I like being involved and um, I always love going to those events mm -hmm. so I wanted to be able to make them as the best they could be and I was also involved in a lot of music mm -hmm. I was in the band at North the, all the time that I was there at North and then I also was in the Oshkosh Youth Symphony Orchestra mm -hmm. um, and I loved playing music I played trombone in both organizations and sure. It was really fun. <laughs> Going, uh, talking about the Oshkosh Youth Symphony Orchestra, you, you said in your essay that playing in the orchestra has taught you how to be trustworthy and responsible. Elaborate on that if you would and explain what you mean there. Well, I play trombone and in the, that's part of the brass section and the winds and brass section, there's usually only one person per part in the, or in the music. Mm -hmm. So we all have the, there's nobody else playing the same notes as us. So we have to definitely make sure that we're practicing and preparing outside of rehearsal because rehearsal is only two hours a week. Right. And when there's 40 people counting on you, you <laughs> learn that you have to get your job done. Sure. Final question for you before we let you go, since we're winding, winding down on the time. As you look back now at your, your high school career, since it is, I guess, over, having been removed from it for just a little bit, is there anything you would have done differently? Um, I don't think so. I think everything I've done, all the clubs I've been in and how much I've pushed myself has definitely made me who I am today and taking college classes early has right. prepared me for college really well. So I think I did everything exactly how I wanted to. Well, that's good. It's good to have to live life with no regrets. So before we let you go, we'll give you our, uh, our plaque recognize you as the student athlete of the month our final student athlete of the month winner which obviously qualifies you for the uh, um, that scholarship thousand uh, dollar scholarship through uh, bank first national and the friends of ocm so thank you both for being here really appreciate the time thank you. thank you all right time to take another break when we return if you like the amazing race and minute to win it then you'll love the 2013 oshkosh heart chase we'll explain why in just a minute Hi, I'm Eric Bertow, 
and I'm asking for your help. The city has several boards and commissions that play important roles in just about every aspect of local government. Whether it's the Parks Board or the Landmarks Commission, these and other boards act as a forum for citizens to address their concerns and questions about Oshkosh City Government. The boards also provide members the opportunity to make positive suggestions to the council or city staff to move the city forward. So here's where we need your help. For our city to work effectively, we need active citizen participation. Many of our boards and commissions currently need members. We're asking for just a few hours of your time each month to serve on one of our boards or commissions and help to ensure a strong democratic process. So please consider serving on a city board or commission. For an application, visit the city website, stop by the city manager's office in City Hall, or call 236-5000. Thank you for your interest, and we look forward to your possible involvement. It's physical, it's mental, and it's for a good cause. It's the trifecta. We turn our attention now to the 2013 Oshkosh Heart Chase. Em Emily Deeringer, if I'm saying that right, yeah. is the guest. Emily, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, no problem. So start for starters, you know, I kind of explained that it's physical, it's mental, it's, it's for a good cause, as I just mentioned in the, in the open. But what is the Oshkosh Heart Chase? Well, the Oshkosh Heart Chase is a fundraiser for the American Heart Association. Um, but more importantly, it's um, kind of a, a fun way to get um, people together out in the community, um, kind of experiencing it in a new way. Um, you know, getting their hearts pumping a little bit, which is good for the mm -hmm. American Heart Association. Right. They like that. Um, and then also kind of challenging people to kind of think a little bit about their health um, and their, some of their lifestyle choices that they're making. So it's, it's not your typical 5K fun run event kind of a thing. It's something a little bit different, mm -hmm. um, more, more like um, Amazing Race meets Minute to Win It. So right. if you watch reality TV, you know what those are. Um, but it's, it's getting clues and doing tasks and running around all crazy with your team and, sure. and trying to complete something and then going to the next challenge, kind of thing like that. It sounds fun. Now, why was Oshkosh selected? Because I know that there's there's not a, many areas that are, are ha, uh, hosting this type of an event. Right, yeah, the, the Heart Association was looking for a new type of fundraising event. Um, people might be familiar with the Jump Rope for Heart or the Go Red for Women luncheons, those kinds of things. And they really wanted something that was more um, physical, mm -hmm. but but something that everyone could do. Right. Um, so they, they were looking around, trying to find a pilot city um, they were looking in Wisconsin, and they picked Oshkosh for a couple reasons. Um, one, there's um, a great sense of community um, in Oshkosh. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people working together. Um, and, and also, um, Oshkosh is a city of events, so what better place to launch a new type of event than in the city of events? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it was about the right size of a population to, to try it out. They didn't want it to be too big in the first year, but they wanted it to be, you know, to have some sort of participation. So um, that's why Oshkosh got picked. Um, last year was the first heart chase in the whole state. Okay. Um, so this year there's one in Oshkosh, and there also is one in Milwaukee in, I think, June. How many people are involved in the, the planning, the coordinating of an event like this? Yeah, the, the um, American Heart Association has kind of an event planner, marketing kind of person that's kind of the leader. And then there's um, about four different organizations and businesses in Oshkosh this year that are, are kind of leading the charge. The Oshkosh YMCA and Rethink are the two nonprofit organizations. Um, Rethink is part of the Winnebago County Health Department. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're taking up a lot of the tasks and then also um, Miles Kimball, and Body Works International, which are both um, community businesses that, that, when I say community businesses, I really do mean community businesses because right. they're very invested in the Oshkosh community. So um, those four organizations are really kind of spearheading um, all the, the back end work, all the behind the scenes sure. things, getting, you know, getting the word out, getting all the um, activities and stuff planned. So You mentioned uh, earlier that last year was the, the first event um, in, in Oshkosh. Uh, how did that event go and, and what was the turnout like? Well, it was really cold. Uh, we laugh about it this year because it's so cold now, but last year it was at the end of April, and the day before, we were out at Menominee Park, and the lake flies were just horrible, and <laughs> we're like, oh my gosh, it's like, we're never going to be able, people are going to not have this. And the whatever. great outdoors. Oh, it was it was horrendous, And but then the next day, it was like 40 degrees out, and kind of chilly, and people had their coats on, and 
Um, but it, everyone that came had a really fun time. There was about a dozen teams, um, and and they they got done, and they were like, "Gosh, this was this was harder than I thought, or this was a lot of work, or this was really fun. I yeah. hope we do it again." So um, yeah, that was really cool. The 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 fundraising, um, the the funds for the fundraiser, um, we raised about four thousand six hundred dollars last year. Okay. Um, through corporate donations and then team fundraising and, and participation, you know, wave, um, registration fees and things like that. So um, it, it went really well for our first year. I mean, you know, people on the back end are like, oh gosh, there were so many things wrong and like, we got to fix this and whatever. But all the participants said they had a blast and it was really fun and they wanted to do it again. So When and, and, and where is this year's event going to be? Yeah, I guess that's kind of important. Um, this year's event is April 13th, um, Saturday and it's at the Winnebago Community Park, so that's on mm -hmm. the north end of Oshkosh, um, kind of by the Sunnyview Expo Center. Um, and it, the registration starts at 8, and the chase starts at 9, and, and teams get about two hours to, to complete as many challenges as they can. Now, is there a, a way to register before day of? Absolutely. You can go to heartchase.org, and I think they're going to throw that up on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, heartchase.org, and you can click in the middle. It says, Join a Chase. And to, you just click that, and then you have to search for Oshkosh or Wisconsin, and then you click that one, and then you can just register. And you mm -hmm. can either register to join a team or to form a team. So if someone asks you, hey, I'm putting together a team for Heart Chase, join my team, then you go to register, and you click join a team, and you type in that, the team captain's name. If you want to start your own team, then you have to create a new team. Um, but it's, it's pretty simple. Sure. And just for, uh, for people who are, are, are interested in joining, uh, one little tip, because I was actually playing around on that site today, uh, you've got to capitalize the O in Oshkosh, because if you don't, it doesn't come up as an event. Oh, that's good so, to know. <laughs> just just for, for people who are interested, I, I typed it in all, all lowercase and then clicked Wisconsin and said no event, and I, I thought, well, where well, is it? And then, I, and then I typed it with the capital, capital. O, and it, yeah. and it came up. So. Uh, just a, a little tip from uh, from your uncle Nick, but uh, <laughs> um, talk about you know registration. You said last year there was about twelve teams. Mm -hmm. How is registration going? I don't know if you have numbers or you've seen how many teams, but it, does it look like it's going to be a bigger um, event than than last time? Yeah, around? we're we're hoping to get more more than than last year because that's how you know it's a successful event and mm -hmm. it's growing. Um, I think the last check we had was about 10 teams. Um, we're still you know, three weeks out, so um, we're hoping a lot of times people can't commit or don't want to commit because right. they haven't seen the forecast yet, uh, so they don't know if it's going to be cold out or whatever. Right. But um, yeah, it's teams of four, and um, you can do a team of three or two, but then you're kind of at a disadvantage for doing some of the, the activities. Sure. Um, so um, registration ahead of time is strongly encouraged. You can register the day of with your four teams. Um, you have to um, pay a $25 registration fee per participant, mm -hmm. or you can commit to fundraising $50, and then okay. that fundraising, or then that registration fee is waived. So it's, it's a reasonable cost um, to participate, and all the money goes to the American Heart Association. What Final question, what can teams, we've, we kind of talked about what it is, but what all can, can teams expect on the actual day of the event? Lots of fun. Um, there's 10 different checkpoints or challenges, I guess. Um, and they, you, you go and it might be something for your brain and you have to answer a bunch of questions or it might be something very physical or it might be something just kind of, you know, lucky, you know, sort of draw you know luck of the draw kind of mm -hmm. thing you might have to dribble a soccer ball through cones and then try to kick the ball through a hoop and okay. if you miss you have to go try again or you, you know things like that or you might have to answer a bunch of trivia questions and play kind of trivia baseball and if you mm -hmm. get the truck and white you get to go on the base and so each one is a little bit different um, so there's not any like oh if you've got like four big beefy guys you're gonna right. have an advantage or if you have four puny little girls or whatever everyone's sure. kind of on the same playing field because it's a good mix of of physical and mental uh -huh. and then stuff that is really off the wall and wacky and, and nobody can practice for it. So. Right. All right. Well, that sounds like a fun time. That That's, uh, that it, like you said earlier, it's definitely different. It's not just show up and, and do a walk or do right. a run. There's there's more to it than that. But uh, we're out of time. So thank you for uh, for sharing all of the uh, the knowledge on the heart chase. And hopefully your, your event, uh, like you said, hopefully it turns out with bigger numbers because what better sign of a successful event? Absolutely. All right, well, everyone loves a good movie, right? And almost everyone has heard of a drive-in, but what is a dive-in? Find out after another break.
The nominees are in. More than 100 VIP artifacts compete in the Oshkosh Public Museum's new exhibit, Outstanding Objects, the Oscar Awards. While the tricycle has charm and good looks to spare, does it have enough momentum to take home an Oscar? Rumor has it that the diving helmet has sunk to new depths by reportedly bribing visitors for votes. Who will win? Only you can decide. Visit the Oshkosh Public Museum today to cast your votes. Outstanding Objects, the Oscar Awards, now at the Oshkosh Public Museum. Do you have a spare hour and a half once a week to share your lunch break with a few special somebodies? Do you want to make a difference in someone's life and see immediate results of your efforts? The Meals on Wheels program could use your help to deliver meals to homebound adults within the city limits of Oshkosh. Routes are set up by neighborhoods and take about an hour and a half to complete. To volunteer for Meals on Wheels, contact me, Judy Ritchie, at 231-9520. Thank you. April 12th, your local YMCA would love for you to come on down and watch a movie in a very interesting way. Tracy Gillis is here beside me now to talk about the dive-in movie nights that are uh, held by the YMCA. Uh, what is a dive-in movie? Like I said in uh, my, my tease before the break, everyone's heard of a drive-in movie. Well, at least I, I think everyone's heard of that. What is a dive-in movie? Dive in movie. We we set up a movie screen on one of the well, on one of the walls in the pool, and we turn the lights down low, play the movie. The kids can swim around, float around, have a good time while they're in watching a movie. That sounds like a, a, a definitely like a, a fun time, an interesting thing. Where did this uh, this idea kind of come from? I mean, was this a kind of a collaborative, uh, I guess, yeah. idea from the, the from the Y? Yeah, we kind of started it a few years ago. We just did one like. One summer we tried one out at the 20th Y. Um, didn't really work out because it's so loud out there. Mm -hmm. um, so we tried one down at our downtown location and it's more enclosed in there. So sure. it's easier to hear the, mu or the, the movie right. better. And um, it went really well. So we decided to continue. And so we do one once a month actually, so. Have the, has the, have the numbers uh, kind of picked up as you've um, proceeded to continue doing these? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this last month, we actually had about 100 people there. Um, so wow. between adults and kids, uh, that was actually the biggest one we had. It might have been the movie. We played Toy Story 3. Oh, so, that's, that's a good choice. Um, pretty popular movie. Yeah. But um, yeah, each month we do different movies. And so, yeah. Is it just now, you said that uh, you, you, you switched over to the downtown YMCA, is, is that the only location locally that, that plays the dive-in movies? Yeah, we only do it at our, at our downtown location, and that's at 324 Washington Avenue. Um, yeah. I know that you mentioned uh, a lot of um, you know, kids, and, and it's, it's a family type of thing. Yeah. So uh, which pool is the movie shown in, and, and how deep yeah. is the water? Because I know, you know some, uh, some nervous parents, I'm one yep, of them, yep. would be, well, uh, what, are the, what if they, you know, <laughs> Flop off of their little uh, floaty in the right. deep end. Where so that said, where it, where are, is the movie actually held? What pool? So we do have two pools at our downtown location. One is our lap pool, and one is our shallow pool, which is three feet deep everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so we played in the shallow pool. Okay. Um, so three feet. Most most kids can touch there. Obviously, the little tots can't. Right. But, um, hopefully, mom and dad's going to be there with them and keep a good eye on them. Um, we do have the lifeguards there that are also watching. I do schedule a lot of extra guards because sure. that's, a, that's a lot of people in right. the pool. And with the lights down low, we have to make sure that I have enough staff who can keep everyone safe. Absolutely. Now, for those uh, who are watching or listening and are interested, how much does this event cost to, uh, to go? Is there a family price? Is it individual sure. per kid? What's the, the cost? The cost is a very, very reasonable. If you're a Y member, it's, abs it's free. Okay. Very nice. Um, but then if you're just a regular family that's not a Y member, it's 525 for your entire family. So if you got two kids in your family, four kids in your family, it's 525 for the entire family. Sure, that does sound like a good deal. Now, for, uh, for people who might be interested in, in bringing their own you know, floaties, uh, if you will, is, is that something that you allow them to do? Because like you said, with, a, with 100 some people, I'm sure you don't want people bringing the giant islands or the, right. or the floating trampolines or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and you know, we're okay if they bring in like, a, like the inner tube and mm -hmm. 
Um, but yeah, we definitely don't want the big, big <laughs> islands and stuff because we do need to see under the underneath. Right and know that there's nobody on the bottom of the mm -hmm. pool. And um, we actually have some tubes that we offer out for people when they come in. And then I also have um, like the fun noodles that we have. So they, they're more than welcome to use what we have. They're also more than welcome to bring what they have, okay. but it has to be reasonable so that we can still be able to see what's going on right. under you, the water. You mentioned that uh, for what the, one of the previous events, you played Toy Story 3. What other movies, um, <laughs> or, or what are some of the other movies you've either shown or are or getting ready to show and uh, when and what time? Um, we do do the, do the movies on Friday nights from 6 to 8 p.m. So sometimes the movies will end before 8. It just right. depends on the length of the movie. Um, our next movie is going to be on April 12th. Mm -hmm. That's going to be The Journey to the Center of the Earth. Okay. Um, so each month I pick a different one. Some other ones that we have coming up are Aristocats, Tangled. Um, we'll have Wreck-It Ralph at the end of the summer. So different movies throughout, right. um, just keep picking different ones. We pick new ones, pick old ones, kind of yeah. mix it up a little bit. How old, is there an age cutoff where you say, oh, well, so-and-so's two, they can't come? I mean, is there a, an age range where you have to be so old to, to be part of this event? Right. Um, everyone is welcome, okay. but they do need to be with a parent if they're five and under. Okay. So anyone who is six and older can come in, swim around by themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyone who is five and under needs to be with a parent. I know outside of the uh, the dive-in movies that, that you just listed off and some of the dates that we showed on the screen, uh, there's going to be some other swimming events coming up soon. Uh, what else is going on here in the near future that uh, that you think deserves mention? Sure. Um, May is actually Water Safety Month, and so on Saturday, um, May 18th, mm -hmm. from 11 to 1 at our 20th location, we will be doing a um, kind of a water safety day for anyone who's interested in coming. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do like wa water safety with them, so life jackets, reach okay. and throw, don't go, mm -hmm. um, just making them aware of what they should or shouldn't be doing okay. around the water. Um, and then the fire department's actually gonna come and do a, uh, like a scuba rescue demo. Okay, that's um, interesting. So that should be really cool. And we're hoping to maybe have like a regular scuba, like try it. Okay. A real basic try it kind of deal. Right. Um, we're still kind of working that out, but we're hoping that we can get that part of that as well. Okay. Um, and then also for Water Safety Month, um, at our downtown location, we are going to be doing some free water safety lessons for um, kids from the Boys and Girls Club. Okay. So um, we do do this, this splash event that we do throughout the year. We do swim lessons with second graders and they get free swim lessons. Um, and so based on all of that information that we got, we really thought it would be great that we get more kids in, more kids in to right. continue doing some water safety stuff. Mm -hmm. So free water, free water safety lessons with those boys and girls club. Sounds kids. great. And then I know uh, there's, since we're running out of time, I'll just yep. mention it. There's pool parties in the summer, uh, Sundays from one to four, and it looks like a couple dates that are already penciled in June 16th, July 21st, and also August 18th. So thank you very much, Tracy, for joining us. And I, I know me. I know that uh, that you're a pro at this, and and you did a great job. So thank you very much. Thank you. Coming up. How do you like your neighborhood? Care to make it even better? We're joined by two experts who can help you make that dream a reality. Next. The nominees are in. More than 100 VIP artifacts compete in the Oshkosh Public Museum's new exhibit, Outstanding Objects, the Oscar Awards. While the tricycle has charm and good looks to spare, does it have enough momentum to take home an Oscar? Rumor has it that the diving helmet has sunk to new depths by reportedly bribing visitors for votes. Who will win? Only you can decide. Visit the Oshkosh Public Museum today to cast your votes. Outstanding Objects, the Oscar Awards, now at the Oshkosh Public Museum. 
Hi, I'm Sue Ponick, and I've got three great reasons for you to support the Oshkosh Area United Way. We're cost efficient, number one, with almost 90 cents of every dollar raised going to United Way agency programs. Number two, your money stays local and directly benefits the Oshkosh community. And number three, the United Way makes a difference. Last year, over 100,000 people were helped by one or more United Way agencies. We hope you'll agree, giving to the United Way makes for a stronger community. Thank you. It's free, it'll be fun, and you just may learn a thing or two. April 13th, a free workshop is being offered to help Oshkosh residents create healthy neighborhoods. Lori Hoover and Shelley Ranke join Oshkosh today. Now, ladies, thanks for being part of the show. Thanks, thanks for having us. us. So I just mentioned the, the workshop. It's creating a healthy Oshkosh neighborhoods, I think, or whatnot is a technical title. What is this event, Shelley, and, and who can attend this event? This event is a workshop geared at um, providing Oshkosh residents information on uh, what is a healthy neighborhood and real concrete steps to uh, forming an, their own neighborhood association in Oshkosh. And who is, uh, is conducting the event? Uh, this is sponsored by NeighborWorks Badgerland in partnership with some existing neighborhood associations in the city. Lori, going over to you now, why did the resident leadership team decide to kind of develop this workshop specifically? Sure. Well, there were about five uh, Oshkosh residents, part of the resident leadership committee meeting, who made the arduous trek down to Orlando, Florida last fall uh, for a Community Leadership Institute mm -hmm. conference. And um, during that conference, it wasn't all sunshine and, you know, my taste or anything. We, um, <clears throat> we came up with this plan to uh, apply for a mini grant through NeighborWorks America, okay. which would um, produce the workshop and bring that back to Oshkosh as a, a part of community building. Mm -hmm. uh, any, anything to add to that, Shelley? No, that about covers it. Okay, mm -hmm. um, now what is that, the Healthy Neighborhoods philosophy? Well, Healthy Neighborhoods is the market-based approach to neighborhood revitalization. Um, we really pay attention to four basic outcome areas, uh, one being the image of the neighborhood, um, also the market, the real estate market for the residential properties. Um, the third thing is physical conditions where all the properties are maintained at a high level of repair. Mm -hmm. And then finally, neighborhood management. So residents are able to manage uh, the day-to-day -day issues in their neighborhood effectively and uh, it creates a neighborhood that is thriving and, and appealing to both residents and others that per will perceive it as a great place to live. And Lori, why in your estimation or in your opinion, why is, uh, I guess, to, to steal from the title of the workshop, creating a healthy neighborhood so vital to, um, y you know, really the, not the survival of, the, of an area, but just the, the general well-being of, of an area or a community, if you will. Sure, sure. Well, I, I mean, most people probably realize that neighborhoods uh, run a course of a, a life cycle, if you will. You know, it, it, it ebbs and flows and, you know, there are peak um, points in the neighborhood. And so sometimes it, it takes a little extra energy um, through transition or attrition uh, to get residents re-engaged or re-infused with that. Um, let's actually have some neighborhood pride. Mm -hmm. And and so <clears throat> in Oshkosh, there hasn't really been a, a strong presence in terms of neighborhood organizations in the past, um, or in the recent past, I should say. There were many years ago, but in the recent decades. So it's really critical right now for us to uh, embark on that effort. Now, when you say create healthy neighborhoods, I mean, what exactly, uh, I guess, what is the definition or, or, or your definition of a healthy neighborhood? Because I mean, that, that seems like it could be taken m multiple ways depending on who you're talking to and what groups of people you're talking to. Sure, sure. And I guess I can only speak for our neighborhood, my experience with our neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, Middle Village Neighborhood Association. Um, for us, we're striving to you know, create an environment where families can uh, live, play, uh, you know, work together, and, and the healthy part comes in where you have social, fun social events that people want to come and be involved with, and, and it's vibrant, and, um, but also when there's work to do, we kind of 
uh, come together and you know either help each other out with some snow removal or we're going to be doing litter pickups. We've we've done that mm -hmm. you know some dumpster days and those kinds of things. So working on improving the appearance of the neighborhood is only one piece of it. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is about those healthy relationships and working together. So since that Middle Village uh, Neighborhood Association started up, when when did it start up? Was it just I mean, unofficially, we started in the fall of 2010, but okay. in 2011, we actually drafted some some basic bylaws and kind of got more formally organized. Sure, and and how much growth, if you will, for lack of a better word, have you seen since the the uh, the founding of this neighborhood association? Sure, and because we're in a, a, a real dense neighborhood, we have a lot of um, transition, and uh, we have a, a little bit higher rental occupancy. Mm -hmm. So um, we've had some people come and go that have been, you know, that started with the core group and, and they're now in other neighborhoods planting the seeds for growth there. Sure. But for us, growth growth really means, um, you know, trying to expand the capacity and, uh, you know, we've been building some partnerships like with Habitat for Humanity, with NeighborWorks, um, mm -hmm. with the city and, and trying to uh, make some big impact on on the appearance and uh, those relationships. Sure. Shelly, going back to the uh, workshop, what will, will, will the participants and people who actually partake in the event, um, what, what will they learn at the event? Well, they're going to learn some best practices for neighborhood organizing, um, you know, what, what the logical sequence of, mm -hmm. of events will be to officially form a neighborhood association. Mm -hmm. They will also uh, learn real uh, tactile, concrete, hands-on ways that they can go home and start creating a healthy neighborhood that day mm -hmm. if they so choose in and, their neighborhood. And they're also going to have the opportunity to apply for one of the seed grants. Correct. Uh, they'll be eligible for applying and for And explain what a seed grant is. Well, we uh, would like to offer any, any new neighborhood organizations that emerge as a result of this workshop. NeighborWorks Badgerland and the Resident Leadership Committee would like to offer some small seed grants to these newly formed organizations to help offset some of the expense that's involved mm -hmm. with starting up. Um, so that, and they can be used a variety of ways. Um, it, whether it's for you know promotional or marketing, um, you know getting the word out in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. or if it's um, to, to help pay for some of the costs to hold that first event, um, we just want to be able to make it a little bit more accessible for sure. people. Either of you can uh, can jump in on this one. This will be one of our final questions. But um, why should residents of Oshkosh attend this workshop? Well, I would say that. Um, Neighborhoods are really important community assets. We cannot afford to lose them. And it really, you know, it comes down to from the healthy neighborhoods approach that this, this is resident driven and, you know, organizations like NeighborWorks and city government can go so far, but when you come down to it, that's your neighborhood and we just really want to encourage folks to, to take ownership and, and start really and caring. In a fun way. In a fun way. Sure. Yes. And finally, right before we let you go, how can residents register or get more information on, uh, on the workshop? Well, they can either call the NeighborWorks Badgerland office. Um, our phone number is 920-230-6766. Or they can email us at oshkoshneighbors at gmail.com. At gmail uh, we'd just like for them to include their name, address, phone number, and the number of people that will be attending. Okay, great. Well, thank you for thank you. the uh, for the information and thanks for filling us in on uh, on the workshop. Thank you. Five segments down, just one more to go before we close out this episode of Oshkosh today. We focus on health after our final break. <laughs> Hello, I'm City Manager Mark Roloff. Roundabouts are new to many of us in Oshkosh, so we have to take extra precaution when using them. Remember, safety is the key. Slow down. The speed limit in the roundabout is only 15 miles an hour. Avoid distractions. Focus all your attention on navigating the roundabout. Find the proper lane. Check out the signage leading up to the roundabout. Choose your lane assignment early and stay in your lane. Evaluate the situation. Take notice of what kind of vehicles are in front of you. Sometimes larger trucks need to take up both lanes of a roundabout. Think to look for pedestrians and allow them to cross when entering and exiting a roundabout. Yield to traffic on your left. You must yield to all traffic in the roundabout and that traffic will be coming from your left. Again, safety is the key. 
Remember that word and what those letters represent, and your roundabout driving experience will be a smooth one. Thanks for your support. Welcome back to the show. Normally in our Focus on Health segments, Ted Stefaniak helps explain or explore different problems and solutions in regards to the human body. But never has he gone as in-depth as today's Focus on Health. Let's find out exactly what I mean by that right now. This Focus on Health segment is brought to you by Aurora Healthcare. Hello and welcome to Focus on Health. I'm Ted Stefaniak. Today we're at the Aurora Medical Center in Oshkosh. And you know, when we do these segments, sometimes we really get a great look at some of the cutting edge technology that they have available at Aurora. And today we get to do that. We're gonna be talking with Dr. Jeff Goldman about digestive health and how a tiny little camera can help diagnose some of your GI problems. Well, thank you for joining us once again today. It's great to see you. And today we're, we're really talking about some, some outstanding technology that's making life a lot more comfortable for the patients that you see. And we're really talking about a, a pill camera. That's correct. And this is the, the actual pill itself. And as well, you may be able to see, half of the uh, pill is, is the actual camera that takes two flash pictures per second. And the other half is a battery pack that lasts eight hours. And this is designed to be swallowed by the patient. And then they, they actually come in on an empty stomach. And they uh, have not eaten for a period of 10 or 12 hours beforehand. They swallow with a little bit of water. And then they're wearing a, it's almost like a Velcro vest. It's got sensors over the abdomen. And then they have a, a special receiving device. It looks almost like a, like a pager that they wear very close to their body. And they wear that for the next eight hours following swallowing the capsule. And then the capsule basically goes through the, through the stomach, so it passes through your food passage, your esophagus, your stomach, and then through the 20 feet of small intestine that isn't ordinarily, uh, you can't reach it generally with an upper endoscope, an upper scope, or a colonoscope, so you're able to see the, the small intestine. So we look for things that may cause obscure uh, intestinal bleeding. So if a patient is anemic, they have a low blood count, which is typically caused by something in an adult's Usually a low blood count is caused by chronic blood loss, and that can be caused by anything from ulcers in the, in the stomach to the small intestine, um, sometimes tangles of blood vessels, uh, tumors, polyps, things of that nature. Uh, celiac disease, which is a sensitivity to gluten in the diet, and that can be picked up with this technology. And then there's a, an inflammatory disease called Crohn's disease that can also be picked up, and sometimes it involves uh, different segments of the small intestine. Yeah, and before that camera, that tiny little camera that could go inside of you, uh, I would imagine life was a little more difficult for patients. Well, it was, and, and we really could not reach the, you know, the small intestine. We would have scopes, perhaps, that could go down a few feet into the small bowel, but could not uh, reach the entire 20-foot you know, segment at the end. So we, we basically now can visualize uh, most of the small intestine you know, with this technology. And then that also tells us you know, where the cause of bleeding is that would ordinarily not be picked up by an X-ray or a CAT scan or some other technology. I would imagine technology like this is making it uh, easier for you uh, as a doctor to, to diagnose and, and even find out if things have been corrected properly. That's, uh, that's correct. And, and so we can, uh, then if we find the, the cause of bleeding, then the patient uh, can have another procedure to actually go down with a, a scope that's, that's larger uh, into the intestine. The bleeding sites can be cauterized or they can be marked so that they can be removed surgically. And, uh, and we can also, if it's Crohn's disease or celiac disease, then we can treat that with a diet or with medication. Yeah. And I know you have some, uh, some photos here from, from the actual uh, pill camera. Can you kind of just show us a little bit about uh, how this is you know, really change medicine? Sure. So what happens is the, the patient uh, has the device and the, and the monitoring device on for a period of eight hours, then they come back, they drop it off, we download the information uh, onto a, a workstation here. So this is actually a, an area of active bleeding. There's a blood clot here that we're actually picking up on the on this study. 
and this patient had uh, multiple leading sites. And, and then we continued to move down, and you can actually move back, and you can actually see some blood here in the lumen. So, and then this patient actually had a, a follow-up scope procedure which was, where it went down several feet into the small intestine, and we were able to find the bleeding site and cauterize it and stop the bleeding. But this is a patient that had required numerous units of uh, red blood cell transfusion, and we were able to, uh, you know, to stop their requirement for that. Once it picks it up on the camera, do you have an idea of the location? Yes, and then you, you have a, and there's actually um, a, there's like a little, almost like a little GPS device here that follows it, and you can actually see it. And then based on the time, too, so that based on the time, so we know that this is in the, in the um, middle part of the small intestine very early in the upper part, so this is called the jejunum, the upper, upper small intestine, based on the time. Whereas if it was, if it was like at five hours, um, then you'd probably be in the lower part of the small intestine. So you'd have a, have a good idea about uh, whether, it's, whether you can approach it from above or from below. And again, how long is the, is the capsule inside of you, or, or how long uh, you Well, it's the, the small bowel exam is, lasts for up to eight hours, and, the, uh, and then the, the capsule itself will pass out in the stool. So once it gets into the colon, then it, it may be another day or so until it comes out, but it, it passes uneventfully, uh, and it's, it's painless when it comes out uh, in the stool. And that may come out in the next day or so. Most people don't even see it. Occasionally, we have some stories that people tell us it, it passes and it's still flashing, things like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> but this again, it, it's technology that that is making things easier for for the doctors and also uh, making you know things easier for patients as well. Oh, it is, and it, and it's um, the only problem sometimes, and the only reason perhaps not to do this is if you have a patient who can't swallow the capsule. Uh, so it's, it's like swallowing a, a large you know, vitamin capsule, but as long as you can do that. But there are some patients, particularly older patients, that may have some difficulty swallowing uh, capsules, but you know, usually most people can, can do that. So if they have a risk of uh, aspiration or difficulty swallowing, then what we sometimes do if they need the, when they need the procedure, then we can actually, we have an introducer that we can actually put on an upper scope and, it, um, and then you actually pass the, the introducer with the scope down through the stomach into the intestine, then you release, it's almost like releasing a satellite. Oh, wow. And then you just, it just releases it directly into the small bowel. But most of the time you don't have to do that. Okay. And if a person is having some, some uh, intestine problems, what would be some of the symptoms that people should be worried about to seek uh, medical attention? Well, it, you'd, um, you'd be concerned if they had uh, bleeding, as if they passed black stool, obviously if they, uh, if they had vomited blood, uh, or if they're simply anemic, or if they just have a low blood count, they just may, may be pallid, their skin may be uh, whiter, you know, it's kind of a white as a sheet type of thing that we talk about, and they um, may have a low blood count, uh, and you may have uh, abdominal pain, cramps, or diarrhea, things like that. And you should immediately seek out your uh, primary care physician at That's that correct. point, I would imagine? Yes. Okay, and then they can get a hold of you if, uh, if they certainly need you. Absolutely. All right, well, thank you for taking some time today. My pleasure. Thank you. Good to see you. It is certainly some amazing technology. Now, if you're experiencing any of the problems that Dr. Goldman talked about, you should seek out your primary care provider. And if you have any questions about that little pill cam or you're having any other GI problems, you can give us a call here at Aurora at 920-303-8700. I'm Ted Stefaniak, and we'll see you next time on Focus on Health. This Focus on Health segment has been brought to you by Aurora Healthcare. That's all the time we have for this edition of Oshkosh today. As always, a big thanks to Ted Stefaniak and all our guests, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Oshkosh Today was supported in part by the Friends of OCM, Aurora Healthcare, 855 Northwest Haven Drive. Set design provided by House of Flowers, 1920 Algoma Boulevard. To find replay times for Oshkosh Today, to be a guest on the show, or to watch online, 
visit our website at oshkoshcommunitymedia.org.